Strange Bedfellows Written and read by Jasper Lestrange I was on a train bound for a dour little town in the northeast of England. I shan't name the town, as people are terribly quick to take offence these days, but chances are you'll recognise it if you've been there too. The purpose of my visit I shan't go into either. Suffice to say it was for work. The job I used to have, such as it was, meant that I had to make occasional trips to towns and cities all over the country, often by train, and often times necessitating an overnight stay. I won't bore you with the nature of the job. In short, it involved having a lot of dull discussions with company stakeholders, some of which could easily have been conducted over the telephone, or Zoom nowadays, and towards the end of my tenure, in all honesty, I felt I was stealing a living. But looking back, I suppose that was all a part of the problem. For this is the story of a sort of crisis I had, a midlife crisis, given my age, but without the humour that implies. For the midlife crisis, after all, is so often the stuff of comedy, the forty-something man who suddenly acquires a sports car and a mistress, a woman of the same age casting everything aside for a fling with a Turkish waiter or Maasai warrior she meets on holiday. Young people are routinely forgiven their mistakes. Old people sympathised with. But the middle-aged aren't given nearly as much slack. They reap what they sow. And when their follies lead to an inevitable disaster, cosmic justice has been served, and we laugh. But this isn't a funny story. Or at least to me it isn't. And depending on who and where you are in your life, Perhaps you won't find it funny either. Now, I wasn't remotely in the market for a sports car, or a mistress for that matter. I'm inherently too cautious, not to mention frugal, for either thing. But there again lay the rub, because I couldn't contemplate my doing something irresponsible and impetuous. No one else could, least of all my wife, and for some reason... The wholly predictable sort of man I had become seemed to test her patience enormously. To all people, it seemed, but especially to Kath, I had become quite boring and irrelevant, well, utterly sexless, of course, and in the way of sexless things, more or less invisible to her and everyone else. I'm articulating this now, but I couldn't have at the time. And at the time, I just remember feeling a little off. But then, another thing about ageing, the general state of being not quite right, aches, pains, or all the various ailments one accumulates when one hasn't been quite so self-absorbed as to look after oneself, had become so normal that there was nothing particular about that day and that train journey, or nothing I could have put my finger on, at any rate. When I say train, I ought to say trains, because getting to said town meant two changes, and it was during the last leg of the journey that I met Caroline. Before that, the seat across the table from me had been occupied variously by a rough-looking chap who talked to himself between swigs of super-strength cider, and an Arab gentleman who surprised me by using his dress, I believe it's called a thoe, as a sort of makeshift tablecloth, arranging a platter of chopped apple, sultanas, and pieces of flatbread on it, and for ten minutes or more, grazing from it in an entirely unselfconscious and very solemn manner. I found this behaviour so unusual that I sent a text about it to my wife, but when she finally replied, it was to tell me off for being judgmental and to remind me to take my tablets. After that, the seat had been vacant for a spell, and I had used the opportunity to spread out a bit, dividing my attention between my crossword and my book, finally defeated by the clue, 
Robot interrupted before action interrupted, a symptom of ageing, which seemed willfully obtuse even by the standards of the setter. I put the crossword to one side and picked up the book. If you must know, it was Biggles Defies the Swastika. As I'd recently had the urge to revisit the wonderful Biggles books from my childhood, and had, much to my wife's chagrin, begun collecting and reading them in order of publication, which she said was a clear indication of having given up. I suppose I'd become so absorbed in the story that I didn't notice another passenger take the seat across from me, and when I did, I realised it was someone I knew, by which I mean recognised, and while I tried to discern how I knew her, she looked up from the book she was reading, and our eyes met. Since I'm not in the habit of staring at women, or anyone, on trains, having been caught doing so, I felt compelled to speak, which is also something I'm not in the habit of. So, seeing her book, it was called Blood on Their Hands, I gestured to it and said, Any good? Because that seemed to suggest I was a fellow reader, curious about books and therefore thoroughly decent, rather than just another man ogling an attractive woman. She frowned and wrinkled her nose in disgust. No, it's appalling, she replied. I made a suitably sympathetic face and it was only then I spotted the subtitle of the book, which was A Women's History of Period Poverty Under the Conservatives. I don't know why, because it shouldn't have mattered, but I suddenly felt embarrassed about my own choice of reading matter, and tried to obscure the cover with my fingers. It was unnecessary, as her attention had moved back to her book, and now, peeking at her over the top of my biggles, I properly noticed her jet black hair, which was styled distinctively in a Chinese bun, with a striking melon streak in the forelock, and suddenly knew where I knew her from. She was somebody I had seen on the television, Caroline something. I'd seen her a few times actually, usually on discussion programs, BBC Two, Channel Four mostly. Once talking about a book she had out, something along the lines of men an owner's manual, which was supposed to help women cope with what she called the clapped-out old bangers in their lives. It had all seemed a bit trite to me, but she had an undeniable way with words, and of course that striking hair, which I suppose is what the TV people go for. I toyed with the idea of texting my wife about it, on the off chance that my proximity to a celebrity might confer some glamour upon me but for some reason or other I decided against it. I think I'd been stung by her indifference to the Thobe story. At any rate, we didn't speak again, and it wasn't long before we reached the station and had to alight, and in the usual hustle and bustle I lost sight of her altogether. Honestly, I didn't really give her another thought. I was too busy working out how to get to my hotel. Back at the office, uh, I'd been assured it was close enough to walk, but somehow or other I made a mistake following the map I'd printed off, and started to feel as if I was going out of my way. It was October, and only just dark, but the few shops and bars and restaurants I passed all seemed to have either closed already, or be yet to open, although the latter seemed unlikely, and I imagined there just wasn't much trade on a Wednesday evening. Certainly the further I got from the station, the quieter those streets became, until I turned onto a very long and very straight road, bordered on one side by waste ground, and on the other by some dingy-looking, vaguely threatening blocks of flats, with barely a soul to be seen. This road was so inordinately long that I began to think I might never reach my lodgings, although my map indicated I was in the vicinity. The further I walked, the more improbable it seemed that there should even be a hotel. Nevertheless, I finally saw ahead of me some reassuring illuminated signage, and light spilling out from the big glass frontage, and quickened my pace. Across the road, a shadowy huddle of teenagers stopped what they were doing to glower and swear at me from a bus shelter, then went back to their task in hand, defacing a poster advertising the lady boys of Bangkok. 
I stepped through the glass sliding door into the brightly lit hotel lobby, which was, I happily noted, clean and modern, if not a little sterile in the way of chain hotels. The front desk was unattended when I arrived, so to announce myself I dropped my travel bag on the floor. It was with more clatter than was warranted, but sufficiently loud to provoke the hotel receptionist, a morose, unkempt-looking man in his late twenties, who shambled out of the back room in the manner of a cartoon bear waking from hibernation, introducing himself as Dennis, and welcoming me in the most rote fashion. We went mechanically, and, I might add, somewhat glacially, through the usual check-in formalities, during which he told me about the bar and the leisure facilities I was able to use when I inquired about the prospect of something to eat. You mean uh, food, he said, miming the dipping of bread into soup or some such, and bringing it to his mouth. Yes, I said. What are the options? He grimaced and looked at his watch. Chef, go home six o'clock. It's seven now. Sandwich only. Just sandwiches. Um, with crisp and salad garnish. I must admit that one of the things I generally appreciated about these overnight stays was being able to enjoy a decent meal and a glass of something and claim it all back on expenses. A sandwich with a few crisps felt a bit like being short-changed, and I was hungrier than that at any rate. What sandwiches do you have? I asked glumly. He produced a square of paper and a small menu, which he proceeded to read to me. Um, we have uh, tuna and cucumber, he said, adding with a wagging finger. But uh, no cucumber because Brexit. Um, bacon, lettuce and tomato, but no tomato, because Brexit. He checked the menu. Oh, and no lettuce. Oh dear, I said. And egg with crace, he concluded. No, wait, just remember that chefs say all out of eggs. Ah, breg, said, I suppose. I was trying, you see, to make light of the situation. But Dennis merely stared blankly back at me with sunken eyes that were almost milky white. Is there anywhere local you can recommend? I asked. No, absolutely not, he said firmly. Um, food outside the hotel is not safe to eat. Uh, there is, I think, a pub near train station that is not bad. But I don't know what time close... We also have at hotel a vending machine on every floor. My heart sank at the thought of making my way back down the long dark road to the station. With a sigh of resignation, I said, a tuna sandwich would be fine, and asked for it to be brought up to me. Then I took the lift to the third floor, and after some time spent navigating the odd corridors. Evidently there had been some refurbishment on the ground floor, but upstairs the decor and layout belonged to an earlier era. I eventually found my room. When one travels with work a lot, as I did then, one develops little rituals, little habits, when staying at hotels. Mine was to first set my belongings on either the bed or the armchair if there was one, switch on the television, and then make a quick inspection of the room. In my mind, I was James Bond in Ian Fleming's Casino Royale. Only instead of looking for surveillance equipment, I was peeking inside the kettle for lime scale, counting the tea and coffee sachets and biscuits, and checking the cleanliness of the bathroom. And then I would sit on the bed to test its comfort, send a message to my wife to let her know I'd arrived safely, and have a little rest and maybe a read before my evening meal. Oh, I'm not sure why. Perhaps it was hunger. But that evening I couldn't rest. I felt oddly restless, strangely unsettled. The room was fine, but stuffy, and when I felt them the radiators were red hot, which made the temperature of the room almost unbearable. Furthermore, when I tried to let some fresh air in, I couldn't, the windows having been fitted, as is usual in hotels, with a lock to prevent full opening. I suppose it's a security measure, or a heat conservation one, 
I have always suspected it's to stop suicidal guests jumping to their deaths, because I'd heard it said that hotels have an unusually high suicide rate. I think the idea is that people prefer to do themselves in, in a place that is sort of cold and anonymous, without all the emotional stimuli of the home. I imagine there are other more practical reasons. At home you run the risk of someone coming in and finding you before you've finished the job. And of course, if you're a considerate person, you'd rather your dead body was discovered by a stranger, albeit probably a poor, unfortunate, lowly hotel worker, than a loved one. Anyway, as someone who has stayed in a lot of hotels, I knew only too well that they can be extremely lonely places. And while I've had some of the best sleep of my life in hotel rooms, I have, it must be said, had my share of nights when sleep seemed as if it would never come. And I had begun to worry already that this was going to be one such time. There I was, pacing the room, wondering when the promised manner from heaven of the tuna sandwich might materialise, when my wife replied to my text message but her own message was to inform me that I'd forgotten to put the recycling bin out that morning. And so it hadn't been emptied. Two hundred and twenty miles or so from home, I'll admit I might have found it hard to appreciate the severity of the situation, or the extent of her distress. Only the angry face emoji she included left me in no doubt. So, feeling a little harassed, I quickly gobbled a couple of ginger nuts from the tea table. Then, with Biggles in tow, set off for the hotel bar, alcohol being the refuge of the defeated, or whatever it is I've heard said. Now, I don't want to paint a picture of myself as some oversensitive, overwrought, overly suggestible type. God knows this story shows me in a poor enough light as it is without you thinking I was a believer in... Well, I never had been, but there was something undeniably strange about the hotel as I made my way through the winding corridors to the lift, with the flickering electric lights, creaking floorboards, the jarring changes in the patterns of the carpets and the wallpaper, the almost palpable silence behind the door of each room, it made me wish I wasn't staying there. But I was staying somewhere, anywhere else. But the ground floor, where the bar was located, was as brightly illuminated, reassuringly modern, and pleasingly sterile, as it had been before, and the bar itself, somewhat incongruously called Nightingale, at least offered the comfort of unintrusive music, low lights, subdued chatter, and the come-hither glow of backlit bottles and glassware. I had walked up to the counter and set my book down before I noticed her. Caroline, the woman from the train, once again I looked at her at the same time as she happened to be looking at me, and so I made what I hoped was a friendly, innocuous look of recognition. A sort of, oh, you again, look, in case she thought I was a stalker who had followed her all the way from the train station. As it happened, she surprised me by giving me a military salute. Captain, she said, then raising her cocktail glass. Chocks away? Uh, then I remembered my Biggles book. Oh, yes. I said, uh, just reliving a bit of juvenilia. All men regress mentally as they get older, she said. Women do too, but they don't have the same luxury of time, so it's less marked. For me, not acting my age is putting on a cocktail dress and trying to pick up in bars. For you, it's reading Biggles. Give it a year or two and you'll be subsisting on a diet of mushed-up Farley's Rust. She skewered the olive in her glass on a cocktail stick and brought it to her lips. Martini, if you're asking, she said. Dirty, of course. Like I said, I'm short on time. And I watched as the olive, God rest its soul, disappeared into her wide, red-lipped, and if it's not too fanciful an observation, faintly vampiric mouth. It seemed ludicrous, but I wondered if she could be flirting with me. Please don't think badly of me. I've never ordered a dirty martini before in my life, and to be honest, it had been some time since I'd bought a drink for any woman other than my wife. But whether I was somehow psychologically discombobulated by the oddness of the hotel and the approach to it, or somehow not altogether myself in these strange surroundings, or whether I was just a bit miffed about the business with the recycling bin, 
I can't truthfully say. But the next moment, Dennis, the hotel receptionist, popped up, appeared as if out of nowhere, this time in his capacity as barman, and I ordered not one, but two martinis, and I even asked for them extra dirty. I noticed Caroline smirk at that, I think because I was affirming the prejudices about men that I knew she had from seeing her on the television, that were all weak, unfaithful, easy in some way. I knew I would have the last laugh because I wasn't about to throw away seventeen years of marriage for a one-night stand with some good-looking woman off the telly. So what brings you to... I asked. A literary festival, she said. <laughs> I know it's hard to believe. She looked around the room. I'm interviewing the author of that book I was reading on the train and then chairing a panel discussion. It's going out as a podcast. She sipped her drink. What about you? Or can't you tell me? Perhaps you're doing spy work, like Biggles. Well, my life had never seemed very interesting. Not even to me. But I did tell her about my job, my hobbies, my marriage. She was surprisingly easy to talk to. The alcohol helped, of course. But I'd forgotten what it was like to have a conversation like this where the other person is paying attention, encouraging you, challenging you, and where there's just the hint of, what shall we call it, romantic intrigue. She even laughed at my stories, never having heard them before, and it was nice when she laughed, because her dark eyes sparkled in the electric candlelight, and her smile showed her perfect white teeth, the kind really only celebrities have. She told me about her own life, and I started to regret my preconceptions about her. I appreciated her bluntness, her occasional earthiness, started to understand what a talented and passionate, driven person she was. I myself am none of those things, but we found we had at least one thing in common. Andrew paused, she said, out of the blue. I'm sorry, I replied. Your crossword puzzle on the train the one about the robot. Andropause, a.k.a. the male menopause. Totally made up, of course. Men don't like to feel left out, so they've had to contrive their own version of women's problems. As you blokes get older, your testosterone levels drop, but only a teeny bit. Instead, the tiredness and forgetfulness and diminished libido you experience is because you all eat and drink too much and don't look after yourselves. Oh, I said. You seem to know a lot about it. I know a lot of men your age, she said. You all can form more or less to type. You're all pent up with rage and unhappiness because you don't have any friends. And even if you do, you don't know how to connect with them on an emotional level. You're usually trapped in jobs you hate, taking your resentment out on the people close to you, your wives and children, which only intensifies your feelings of disillusionment when they stop respecting you. And you try and numb the pain by gorging on food and drink or indulging in other self-destructive behaviours and compulsions, which again only serves to make you more and more dissatisfied with your lot. I didn't respond immediately. I felt, to use the modern parlance, seen. When I did speak, it was to make a weak joke. Are you trying to seduce me? She was already tipsy, certainly tipsier than I was and it was with some difficulty she managed to fix me with her stare. I'm laying my cards on the table, she said. I've worked hard for everything I have. All my life I've striven to be the best version of myself, and not to settle for second best. I didn't want what society expected of me, or what my mum and dad wanted for me. I wanted to be a strong, independent woman, speaking her truth to the world. And if that world didn't want to listen, to make it damn well listen. And now I'm 45 years old. I don't have a partner, I don't have children. Let's face it, that ship has sailed. And I can just about look you in the eye and say I don't regret a single thing, but no one ever told me I'd end up so... so bloody lonely. So when I stay in hotels, I put on this dress, put on this war paint, and try to score just to feel something, do you understand? Just to remind myself I'm not dead from the waist down.
I'll be honest with you, I didn't know how to take all that. I often find when people are being very open and sincere, I just feel embarrassed for them a little bit. More for myself, because somehow I don't know what the correct human response is. I might as well be that robot in the crossword clue. But it was more than that. The look on her face when she said it. It was like she was haunted. In the uneasy silence that followed, Caroline took a business card from her clutch, placed it on the bar, wrote on it, and slid it across to me. Look, she said, regaining her composure. I can't pretend you're what I usually go for, but you're the best proposition here tonight. Room 237. I'll be waiting. And with that, she rose from her stool at the bar and disappeared. You'll forgive me, I hope, for glossing over some of what followed, in the interest of maintaining momentum. It is of no relevance to my story that I reminded Dennis about the tuna sandwich, and his grumbled apology barely warrants a mention. You should know that I returned to my hotel room in a very agitated state of mind. I found that I couldn't concentrate on Biggles defies the swastika, despite Biggles having just been caught by Eric von Stolhein of the Gestapo. I did fill in Andrew Paul's on my crossword, but when I looked at the completed grid, all the answers seemed to be taunting me. Milk toast, pitiable, pusillanimous, bin. And now, Andrew Paul's. Android interrupted, an android, a robot, an automaton, not a man, but an approximation of one, mechanical, lacking emotion, interrupted. Minus the id, the id, the primal urge, the source of libidinal energy. Where was that bloody tuna sandwich? I still don't know whatever possessed me, but I knew then I was going to visit room 237. How could I not? The carrot had been dangled, an erotic carrot that was impossible to resist, or if not quite impossible, I was disinclined to resist it. And so, maddened with desire to be near this magical, sensual woman, I rushed, after a quick shower, shave, spray of deodorant and gargle, to be with her. But once again the corridors were strange. It was as if they shifted under my feet. Room numbers seemed to run out of sequence. The distance between floor and ceiling was constantly changing and the garish pattern in the carpet seemed almost alive, as if it were teeming, swarming, with hundreds and hundreds of writhing snakes. It was with great relief that I finally found my way to the lift and tumbled through its parting doors. But even then I was presented with something disquieting and uncanny, for as the lift doors closed behind me, I saw that I was not alone. There was a woman in the lift, standing with her back to me, and I could tell from her size and shape, posture, that she was very, no, terrifically old. And though the overhead light in the lift was on the blink, and kept sporadically plunging us into complete darkness, every time the cabin was illuminated, I could see her reflection in the mirrored rear wall, and her face was completely shrouded by long, lank, tendrils of matted grey hair. I turned and hit the button for the second floor, and the lift clanked and clanged into action. Action interrupted as it turned out, for in the very next moment it stalled, came to a juddering halt, and everything went dark. Oh dear, this doesn't look good, I said rather too loudly. I was conscious that my fellow passenger in the lift was oddly silent. Do you think we're stuck? She didn't speak, but in the absolute darkness I was acutely aware of her movement. She was no longer behind me, and it was all I could do to try and reach out and touch her. But then I felt a brush of hair like cobweb against my left cheek. 
then a voice, thin, cracked, impossibly ancient, said, I know what you are. I sent out a hand and repeatedly pressed the second floor button, and, thank heaven, the lift groaned back to life. Light came back on too, and I was relieved to find my companion had retreated to the back of the cabin and was merely stood once again with her face still obscured by that grimy curtain of matted grey locks. As soon as the doors opened, I was out of there. I hurried to Caroline's room banged on the door, only afterwards thinking a light knock would have been more suave. She unlocked the door to let me in, and I caught a fleeting glimpse of her in a satin, kimono-style dressing gown, before she rushed back into the bathroom. Make yourself at home, she said from behind the bathroom door. There's wine on the side, but the silly receptionist didn't bring glasses, so it'll be teacups, I'm afraid. If you're going to take your clothes off, can you fold them nicely and put them on the chair? I don't fancy tripping over those Marks and Spencer blue harbour chinos in the night. And please take your socks off. I always think men in socks look so ridiculous. I didn't reply. In truth, I was unable to speak. Not because it had suddenly dawned on me that I had made a terrible mistake. Nor because I had hoped, no, longed for some seduction, some semblance of romance, and that fantasy had been immediately dispelled. But no, it was because I was looking at a man who was sitting on the bed. A man just sat there on the bed, naked, save for a white towel wrapped around his waist. He was dark-skinned and overweight, and looking back at me with the most hangdog expression I've ever seen on a man, almost as if he were her captive and being held against his will. Just then the bathroom door opened, and Caroline stepped out. She looked stunning, of course, but in the presence of this other man, my ardour had cooled somewhat. I felt humiliated, foolish, ashamed. What's the matter? she asked. Why are you just standing there? Oh, don't tell me you've got stage fright. I looked at her, then at the man on the bed, then back at her. I thought, I began, I don't know what I thought, but this, I'm sorry, it just doesn't do it for me. She looked hurt, not to mention puzzled, but I was already making my exit. But wait, she called from the door, I, I don't understand. No, I said sharply. I'll admit to feeling rather exhilarated in my indignance. You wouldn't, you bloody London media types with your perversions. You're all the same. Obviously I wasn't about to chance the lift again, so took the stairs back to the third floor and my room. And when I got there I told myself off for being such a bloody idiot. What had I been thinking, placing my marriage in jeopardy like that? But at the same time I felt... Yes, that word again, exhilarated, because I knew I'd had an experience, a life experience in capital letters, and I was at the time in my life when I thought there weren't many of those left to have, and at least I thought I had stopped it before it had gone too far, and I could go home to Kath with a clean, or relatively clean conscience. It was true also that I was flattered by Caroline's attention. What had she said about me? The best proposition in the hotel? The trouble was I still couldn't rest. My heart was pounding, my mind racing, and the room was still unbearably stuffy. I needed to do something to calm myself down, and that's when I recalled Dennis telling me about the swimming pool and spa facilities for the guests. As I always make sure to pack swimming trunks in case of such eventualities, I decided that's what I'd do. A swim would tire me out, help me get off to sleep. A spell in the sauna or steam room would get rid of some of the tension. So I got my stuff together, headed down to the basement where the spa was located. At first I thought I must have taken a wrong turn, 
as the staircase leading down had metal steps and seemed rather dark and dingy, making me think I had unwittingly found a service staircase instead. But soon enough, signs, not to mention the smell of chlorine, let me know I was on the right path. I passed an unmanned reception desk, behind which rolled up white towels were available for guests, then into the changing room, and finally into the pool. It was quiet, immediately calming. The blue light shimmering on the water's surface, and lights set into the sides of the pool, giving it a warm, inviting glow. I dove in. I swam. It was so nice to get into the water, and I felt some of the tension already beginning to dissipate. Around the poolside there were sun lounges to lie on, and on one side a room, a steam room, with blue-green light showing through the fogged up window. I quite fancied the idea of sitting in that room, letting the hot steam swirl around me, clearing my head, easing my joints and muscles. So I hauled myself out of the pool, toweled myself off, and opened the door of the steam room. I was instantly hit with a pleasant wave of heat, and closing the door behind me, took my place on the tiled bench against the left-hand wall of the room. The cloud of steam was so thick I could barely see, and I couldn't be sure how far back the room went. The swirling mist was so thick. I pressed my back against the hot, dripping tiles, and closed my eyes, relishing the healing, purifying heat against my skin. I breathed in deeply through my nose and exhaled through my mouth. Ah, relaxation. But something wasn't right. I had a sudden intimation that I was not alone, that there was someone at the back of the room behind that dense wall of steam. It was enough to make me catch my breath. And when I did, I was convinced I could hear the breathing of another, slow and heavy. I squinted into the darkness, trying to make out the shape of my companion, if indeed there was one. Hello? I said. No answer, but the laboured breathing continued. What was it about this blasted hotel, I thought? I couldn't expect to have the hotel facilities all to myself, but if I was going to share a steam room with another guest, at least they could have the decency to make themselves known to me. Hello? I tried again. There was movement in the mist. A slight groan, the kind I tended to make myself when getting up after sitting down for a prolonged period, or well, so my wife had informed me and a dark outline pushing through the cloud. I recognised the shape almost right away. The bloated, bulky figure was assuredly that of the man who had been on the bed in Caroline's room. He still had the white towel around his middle. But what was he doing down here? His heavy breathing grew louder as he approached me. And then... I even gasped. He came to a stop right in front of me, his wet, swollen belly, inches from my face. Beads of condensation and sweat dripped from him onto my thigh, and, I swear, they were ice cold. Then I heard his hands slap against the wall tiles on either side of me and again thrust his distended stomach unpleasantly close. Do you mind? I snapped, sliding along the damp bench towards the door. He said nothing. He just stood there, propped against the wall, breathing heavily like some dying animal. I bolted out of the steam room, and, outraged, not to mention a little unnerved, dressed hurriedly and went directly to the hotel reception. When Dennis eventually shuffled into position at the front desk, I told him angrily and indignantly what had just happened. A man tried to attack you. 
He looked sceptical. Yes, down in the spa, I said. But, sir, he said, regarding me strangely, there is no spa at the hotel. What? I said. I was about at the end of my tether, I don't mind telling you. How do you explain my wet trunks? No, no, said Dennis. At a hotel we call a wellness suite, no spa. Look, I want to report a violation on my person by another guest at this hotel, and if you're not going to do anything about it, I shall ring the police. And I suppose you won't do anything about it, because you can't even get a tuna and bloody cucumber sandwich without the sodding cucumber to my bloody room, even though I ordered it four pissing hours ago. Dennis, give him his due, was too indolent for even my sudden outburst to rouse him. He merely replied, What's man at the hotel? The fat man, Mediterranean-looking chap, was with the lady up in room 237. Once again he regarded me with that peculiar look on his face that made me want to strike him. I think, he said at length, I think sir is tired and uh, need lie down. Eh, to use steam room when intoxicate is not good. Intoxicated, I snorted. Of all the... But the more I spoke, the more ridiculous I felt. It wasn't as if the man had actually molested me. He hadn't even touched me. And though it pained me to say it, Dennis was right. I wasn't used to martinis, dirty or otherwise, and I was tired, not to mention hungry. I had simply overreacted. That was all. So I went back upstairs to the third floor, and on my way I remembered something else Dennis had mentioned, about there being a vending machine on every floor. I couldn't get a meal or even a sandwich at this rotten place, but maybe a bag of crisps and some chocolate was better than nothing. I swear to you, that's how it was I ended up on the roof. There I was, going round and round the strange, ever-shifting corridors, turning unexpected corners, finding new sets of double doors in my path that I swore weren't there before, and dead ends that forced me to retrace my steps, until I found one door that sent me up another flight of service stairs, and another, and another until I emerged unexpectedly through the final door that opened out onto the roof. I stepped out into the cool night air, into a strange landscape of metal vents and pipes and coils of cable and rope, and spread out before me the dismal town and whatever other dismal towns and cities and villages and farms and fields and forests lay beyond it. And I don't know why, but I kept walking, walking to the edge of the rooftop, and looked down at the street below. A lady boy of Bangkok smiled back at me from the bus shelter, having grown a moustache. Dennis was stood outside the hotel's front door, smoking, his pale, drawn face given a rosy glow by the red tip of his cigarette. What was I doing up here? At that moment, I heard a sudden noise. The door, the same one I had come through, had burst open, and through it came the same man. The man from room 237. The man from the steam room, still wearing nothing but a white towel around his waist. He had followed me up onto the roof, and was coming straight towards me, still with that hangdog expression, those doleful eyes. One arm outstretched as he drew nearer. I swore he meant to hurt me. I was ready to defend myself, to shove him away if he got any closer. I was about to shout at him, Stay away from me! But in the end, I didn't get the chance. For, please don't think I've lost my mind when I say this, it was almost as if he walked through me. Or rather, he fell through me. I staggered and nearly fell myself, which would have sent me over and seen me plummet to my death if I hadn't managed to steady myself. 
But he fell, silently, with no scream, and only the sickening sound of his body as it smashed into the pavement below. My heart thumping, scarcely able to believe what had happened, I looked down and saw him. The towel had come loose when he fell, leaving him naked, with his huge white buttocks shining up at me in the glare of the streetlight. Dennis, for some reason, didn't react. I called out, Don't just stand there! Call an ambulance! At which point he looked up, clearly wondering what I was doing up there. Sir, please come down. It's not allowed for guests to be on roof, he said. I found him back behind the reception desk when I returned to the lobby. We had both witnessed a man fall to his death, and he looked completely unmoved by it. I, conversely, was somewhat shaken. He, he just walked right off the edge. I stammered. I couldn't do anything to stop him. Dennis looked at me, and this time it was a look of sympathy. No, there was nothing you could do to stop him, he said. But watch. And I followed his gaze to the hotel entrance, and watched in utter disbelief, as the man, the man who I had only just seen broken and splattered on the pavement, walked through the door, this time fully dressed in business attire, and as if nothing had happened. And though I'm not given to melodrama, I'm afraid that was when I blacked out and collapsed to the floor. When I came to, I was with Dennis in the little back room, and he had given me a sticking plaster for my forehead, which had a nasty cut on it. Apparently I had banged my head on the desk when I fell. What was that? I asked. The man was as real to me as you are now. Dennis, for whom speaking in English was a challenge, and was normally a man of few words, now spoke at some length. I have done my best to record what he said. This hotel, like all hotels, have ghosts. People come here stay and are not happy. They come here to end their lives, but their souls linger, doomed to repeat their final hours over and over again. The man you saw, he stayed at hotel three years ago. A businessman who to outside world was big success, but whose business was failing and private life unhappy. That night, when he stay in room 237, he decided to take his life. He went up to roof and threw himself off. What you saw tonight was that man's last night on earth. But not everyone see. Yet you've seen him, I asked. I, I used to, he said matter-of-factly. When I first came here, I saw, but no longer. Let me tell you, I am religious man. Where I come from is not so unusual as here. I believe in the spirit, in the soul. And I think these spirits, when they show themselves to us, it is because we have need to see them. I think you saw this man for reason. And you no longer have reason. He stared at me, incredulously. Look at me. I have very good job with responsibility and great prospect. I live in beautiful town, in fantastic country of United Kingdom. What more do I need? I am, how you say, contented man. I am a happy man. 
As I said, I often don't know what to do when people are very sincere and earnest. When Dennis said this, I wanted to hug him. What about the old woman in the lift? I said. The one with the long grey hair. Oh, her. She's just a very old lady who live at hotel. He suddenly remembered something, and, beaming with a smile that showed a dozen yellow teeth like crooked tombstones, passed me a plate. It was, hand on heart, the finest tuna sandwich I'd ever tasted. The next day I went about my business, I think with something of a spring in my step. I don't know why, but I felt changed by the whole experience I'd had, as if I'd been going along on one path, but now a new path had been opened, and I was on that one instead. Perhaps some of this newfound positivity was radiating from me, as I felt as if people were treating me differently, even just the people who passed me in the street who served me at the coffee shop in the station. On the train home, I mulled it all over in my mind. The only regrettable thing, I thought, the only really regrettable thing at any rate, was that I'd had this amazing transformative experience happen. Something that would make a first-class anecdote. And yet, for obvious reasons, I couldn't tell any of it to my wife. Even if I took out all the business with Caroline, going to her room, well... It was just too unbelievable a story to tell. But I was going to tell her that I wanted things to be different from now on. Different between us. I was going to tell her that I knew I had become a bit set in my ways, a bit difficult to live with. And that it wasn't all my fault. She could make some changes too. And above all, I wanted to let her know my feelings for her had never changed. I still loved her. Wanted her. Needed her. What have you done to your head? She asked suddenly. But that was several hours after I'd got in, and she was preoccupied with an antiques programme she liked on the television. Oh, my suitcase fell out of the overhead storage, I said. Seemed plausible. Kath gave me a withering look that was a mixture of exasperation, and bewilderment, pity, and tenderness all at once which I suppose is what love is. You silly man, she said softly, and with a gentle caress of my forehead. You need to be much more careful. At your age. Today's story was Strange Bedfellows by Jasper Lestrange. It was read by Jasper Lestrange. Well, thank you for listening, and I do hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, Happy Halloween. And of course, sweet dreams. Well, here we are, Halloween already. It'll be Christmas before you know it. If that doesn't scare you, nothing will. Well, hopefully you're listening to this having just heard my story, Strange Bedfellows. If not, go and listen to it at once. Um, and first of all, a confession. Um, until this past weekend, I didn't know what I was going to do for Halloween. I didn't even have a completed story. I've had a bit of a cold and whatnot, and I'd been turning over a few ideas in my head. 
because it always feels like I should do something special for the Halloween episode. I'd had this idea of doing something about a, a podcaster, recording a podcast in a, a purported haunted house or um, out in the woods, like Blair Witch Project. Um, but that was all I had, just the idea. And as time ticked on, I thought maybe I could just make group some stories together, like I did in 2021 um, with the Halloween special. Um, incidentally, some people have said they wonder what it is I look like, which is natural, I suppose, but always I find ill-advised with radio broadcasters and podcasters and people you only know from their voice, because when you do see them, they always look completely different um, to what you imagined. Um, usually, not in a good way. Um, but um, for those of you that, that are interested in such things, there is an Easter egg in the 2021 Halloween special, and I know at least one person managed to find it. So, there you go. Anyway, like I say, I wasn't even sure I'd have time to get something out um, for Halloween. But, you know, you do feel obligated to, you know, the fans. Im imagine me giving a Paul McCartney star thumbs up. You know, the fans expect it on Halloween, you know. Um, so, well, there's nothing like a deadline to put a rocket up one's aris. So I had some half-finished things, just a few sketches of ideas, some bits and bobs. Um, I write things down and make notes. of. I've, I've got loads and loads of stories that I've never quite got around to taking any further. And if I squinted, I could sort of make the shape of a story. So that's how I ended up with this one, Strange Bedfellows. And um, I'm going to tell you a bit more about it in this episode of Postmortem. By the way, if this um, if this uh, sounds a bit different than usual, it's because um, I'm on such a tight schedule to get this out for Halloween. I'm actually recording this during my lunch break at work. I've got this wireless Bluetooth mic. Um, if it sounds a bit different, just going through my phone. Um, what if it sounds better? Oh gosh. Um, and I've had to find somewhere nice and quiet and private to record. And I'm in a room with a piano. Yeah? You see, they've got rooms with pianos where I work. Listen. Cause this is thriller, thriller night And no one's gonna save you from the beast about to strike Cause this is thriller You get the picture. We could all have a sing-along later. So, um, where to start? Well, I must say, I find writing stories really, really, really hard. Um, some of the ones I've done have been easier than others, but usually I tend to have two or three bits um, in a film you'd call them set pieces um, in this case I knew I was going to have a bit in a steam room um, that was an idea I'd had ages ago um, just because I'd once been in a steam room and the steam was so thick I couldn't see who else was in there and then I felt something soft touch my leg um, and I think it was a wrist I hope it was um, and I already knew it would end on the roof, and I also had what, what I hope is this funny idea about the man going to the woman's room and seeing a man on the bed and getting the wrong idea because he, he doesn't know it's... Stop it. Because he doesn't know it's just a ghost. Uh, and I even had, um, already in my head, um, this ironic little speech that the Dennis character gives at the end. I thought it was just kind of a funny idea to have this lachrymose character um, talk about how much he loves his life. So I've got these things that I think are going to be in the story, and then it's a case of stitching it all together. And this is really where I w wish I was a better writer, you know, or a prose stylist, they talk about. But the hardest thing about it for me is just finding ways to make someone picking up a cup or walking down some stairs seem interesting. I you know, I, I'm in admiration of of all the authors that we've we've done on the channel. You know, I, I find it uh, like pulling teeth. 
But anyway, as, as I was writing it, um, I thought this is almost like an anti-horror story because although it's set in a haunted hotel, um, the ghost is benign. Um, well, it's indifferent. It's, it's a sort of trace memory of something that's happened. Um, it doesn't care whether you're there or not. And then I thought, well, actually, you know, the horror here is, is the horror of growing old. Because um, I don't know about you, but I'm nearly 50 years old now. And, you know, I try to stop it, but I'm increasingly irascible. Um, I think it's a good word for it. I'm constantly irritated and appalled by things I see and hear. And, you know, I think like a lot of people, you think the world's going mad. Um, and I also I sometimes feel invisible. Um, you know, young people, they just walk in front of me in queues. And they, I'm like, it's like I'm not even there. And this hurts to say, but a few years ago, um, so I wasn't even as old as I am now, um, I was in a meeting and my boss interrupted me and said, can we hear from someone younger? And so I wanted this story to be a bit about how, you know, us middle-aged people have feelings too. Um, some of it's drawn from real life. I really did have a job where I used to go travelling with work and I'd either be on my own or with a group of other people. And I loved it when I was on my own, absolutely loved it. Just being on the train, meeting, uh, doing the crossword, um, you know, an evening of peace and quiet at a hotel, a nice hotel somewhere. Uh, but when I had to look after other people, awful. Um, one day, I, whoops, one day I must tell you about what happened in Worthing. You must remind me. You see, I can tell you all my well-worn anecdotes now because I've got a new audience and you can't even interrupt me. I need to tell you what happened to me in the English Garten in Munich. Um, that's quite a story. We'll do that one day. Um, but yes, so uh, in case you're wondering, the town I was thinking of is Middlesbrough. Um, I can't actually remember much about it, but when I got there, everything was shut. And I think the streets were empty because they, they'd just brought in these talking lampposts. Um, so what would happen is if there was a group of hoodies loitering, um, the voice would come out of the lamppost and say, hello, 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 on your way now. Ain't you got homes to go to? That kind of thing. Um, and I'm, pro I'm probably dissing Middlesbrough. I'm sure it's a lovely place, really. Um, what else can I tell you? Well, I wasn't sure how to end the story. I did think about having the narrator choke on the sandwich or get food poisoning or something and then come back as a ghost himself. Um, that seemed like it was a good twist for the Halloween episode. Um, but then you'd have to change the start. And it's always a bit weird, isn't it? Because really, if you were telling the story, the first thing you'd say is, I'm a ghost. Um, you wouldn't leave it to the end. Uh, anyway, I chose this ending, which was sort of sad, but hopeful. Um, something a bit quieter. What else um, can I say? Well, I was just trying to do something a bit different, that's all. I, I thought, what if it was a horror story, but it had these elements of bedroom farce, um, which is how I ended up calling it Strange Bedfellows. You know, Strange Bedfellows. The West End hit now in its 50th week at the Criterion. Um, before that, I was calling it Nothing Happened. Uh, because it seemed like a bit of a shaggy dog story. But other than that, um, if you do have any thoughts about the story yourselves, let me know in the comments. You tend to have better ideas than I do. So, happy Halloween to you all. Thanks again. And until next time, stay spooky. He did the match. He did the monster match. The monster match. It was a graveyard smash. He did the match. Hello. Hi, I'm sorry, you're not Ian, aren't you? You what, sorry? You're not Ian, are you? I'm not Ian.